Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. When most of us think of Sweden, or more broadly the Scandinavian countries, we imagine a more egalitarian and advanced model to which we should aspire. Some on the left in America assume without investigating that Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries, Denmark and Norway, have figured out how to be prosperous socialist countries. It was the scholar Emanuel Wallerstein who explained how Denmark is not a model, because the entire world can't live like that. Denmark's standard of living requires an unequal exchange with the global south. But this Swedish model is uglier than it might appear to be, with a brutal history and a dangerous present. Here to elaborate on this is Torko Lausen, a longtime anti-imperialist activist and writer who spent years in prison for his militant activities as a member of a clandestine communist cell. Torkel is also the author of several books, including The Global Perspective, Reflections on Imperialism and Resistance, The Principal Contradiction, and Riding the Wave, Sweden's Integration into the Imperialist World System. Torkel, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on, and I'm so excited to get into all of these important topics, and I think you're one of the best people to talk about them. But, you know, before we zoom out, if you will, into Scandinavia and how it was integrated into the core of imperialist states and what role it played in colonialism and imperialism. Why don't we start with how you look at the world system? So why do you take this global perspective and what is it? Well, um, the global, as you mentioned, uh, the global perspective is, is uh, very important for my way of uh, looking at the world. Uh, as it uh, certainly is for the late uh, Wallerstein uh, also. And the reason for this is that that um, uh, the world system, the global conditions has a huge impact on what is going on locally and nationally and regionally. So we have to look from, from the global perspective and also look for what I call the principal contradiction because they have a very big influence on, on local uh, contradictions. Uh, for instance, if we take um, uh, capitalism as, as a system, um, uh, the, the development of, uh, of capitalism ran parallel with the development of, of, uh, of colonialism. And from the 15th century to to the breakthrough of industrial capitalism in, in uh, England, there is this uh, uh, parallel between the development of colonialism and the establishment of uh, industrial um, uh, uh, capitalism. But it was not only a kind of globalization of, of uh, capitalism, it was also a polarization of the of the of the world system into a imperialist core and a semi periphery and an exploited uh, uh, periphery and this is an essential feature of uh, capitalism imperialism has always been a part of uh, of the capitalism since the beginning of uh, 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 the system and um, but let us uh, zoom into to the Scandinavian countries and see how they were draw into the uh, imperialist uh, system. Um, yeah, and then I think I just want to say I think this is so important because you know for our mostly American audience to understand because when it comes to the issue of imperialism, as you just described it, they don't see Scandinavia the Scandinavian countries as a part of that system. So please go ahead and and kind of helping us understand. Yes how that works. Yes, yes. actually, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, the mm. running up for the president, this, the socialist Democrat or socialist um, uh, politician uh, often mentioned the Denmark and the Scandinavian countries as a socialist model or, and also very many uh, figures in the third world also think of uh, the Scandinavian countries as a halfway to uh, to socialism and certainly also in the Scandinavian many leftists also see uh, our model and the capitalist welfare state as as uh, the first step or halfway towards uh, socialism but you can only look at it in that way if you take colonialism and imperialism out of the equation and certainly you cannot take it out of uh, the equation um 
all the Scandinavian countries, especially Denmark and, and Sweden, participated in, in uh, uh, the colonial system just from the, uh, from the beginning in the 15th and 16th century. Denmark uh, had uh, itself had small uh, colonies in, uh, in the Caribbean, which is now the Virgin uh, Islands. Um, and we have colonies also in, uh, in uh, Ghana, from which we, uh, we sold slaves and transported slaves to America. And we have uh, colonies in, uh, in, in trading colonies in uh, West India. Um, and if, if, if we first take an, uh, the Danish integration in the system, it's, it has a lot of, uh, to do with Danish agriculture. Mm. Um, mm. When, the, when there was a rise in the living standard in, in uh, England and also in uh, Germany towards the end of the 19th uh, century, when colonial profits um, started to uh, make it possible to raise the, the wage level in uh, England, um, they started to consume uh, eggs and bacon and uh, poultry and butter and all kinds of, of ag ag agricultural uh, products. And they were to a large extent uh, imported from uh, uh, Denmark. So the breakthrough of, of, of Danish uh, industrialism has to do with the export of the agricultural products to the English market um, <laughs> because it developed our logistic system, the railroads, the, the transport to England with, uh, with ships, the diaries, the slaughter industry, uh, making tools for agriculture. So ag agriculture uh, production and export for England was the driver for the development of, of Danish industry and included um, uh, Denmark in, uh, in the uh, 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 orbit of, uh, of British uh, imperialism. It was very different with the Sweden. Uh, Sweden didn't have that uh, de developed ag agriculture, but Sweden had for a long time been a producer of uh, iron and copper and other raw materials, uh, uh, timber and, and, and wood and uh, paper and, and, and so on. So it was these raw materials which was the basis for the for the breakthrough of, of Sweden. And they were included not uh, by uh, England, but by Germany. They exported iron and um, especially timber for uh, Germany. So they were included by this uh, uh, German market. But, but merchant ships played mm -hmm. a huge role. Uh, Denmark was, and uh, the Scandinavian countries was a big, uh, uh, merchants uh, fleet in the world. I think that uh, England possessed the biggest uh, merchants fleet and then come US and then third came the Scandinavian countries, which was uh, bigger than Fra France and uh, the Netherlands and uh, Germany. So we have a huge uh, merchants fle uh, fleet which uh, transported not only colonial uh, goods to the imperialist core, but also trade between the imperialist countries because they were often in, in war with each other and the Scandinavian countries remained neutral so, so they could trade with, uh, with everybody. Um, can you, can you, oh, sorry, I think this is probably where you're going next, but can you also kind of discuss Sweden's settlerism, as you call it? Like, yeah, why did yeah. so many Swedes and Danes leave their home yeah. countries and yeah. settle abroad? And why was this important yeah. for the survival of imperialism? Yeah. yeah. Uh, settler, uh, settlerism is, is a very important aspect, especially of, of the Swedish uh, colonialism. Um, uh, I think it's uh, a little more than one million people uh, left Sweden for for North America mainly, and this is a very high percentage of of uh, the population in 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 Sweden. I I think it's around twenty five percent or or nearly thirty percent of the population immigrated. Uh, uh, between uh, 1850 and to the First World War, so so it it was quite a lot of uh, of people, and this was mainly due to 
to poverty uh, in 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 Sweden, especially in the in the countryside. Sweden was much poorer than Denmark. There were actually hunger uh, uh, sometimes in in uh, Sweden during the uh, 19th uh, uh, century. So a lot of people left uh, uh, Sweden to uh, go to the United States uh, mainly. Um, for instance, in 1900, there were living uh, 100,000 people in Sweden, uh, in in Chicago, in in the United States, um, but they were also uh, settled in in the West uh, doing uh, farming, and in this uh, transfer over the Atlantic Ocean. They also uh, there was a transfer in in mentality also you know from a from a poor poor agricultural workers to uh, settlers because they were included in the American labor market on a very high uh, level uh, just beneath the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, settlers from. From England and 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 so on. So so they received the the best job and and higher wage and certainly also uh, uh, have a have have a higher living standard than the immigrants from uh, from uh, Eastern Europe mm -hmm. and not to speak about the immigrants from China and India and not to speak about the slaves and the original population in in america which was uh, squeezed out uh, from from the uh, countryside so they so they um changed you know from proletarians to to uh, to settlers uh, during this um, during this um uh course over the land there, there is a if you have time there's a very interesting story ab about yes please uh, the leading, actually, the the leader and 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 the person who uh, established the Danish social uh, democracy in, uh, around 1800 and and 70. His name was uh, uh, Louis Pio, mm. and uh, he was a worker, an ordinary uh, worker. Most of the leaders of of, of the social the, the democracy in the Scandinavian countries were actually uh, uh, workers, and he. Um, there was a big strike in uh, in uh, Denmark, and he was speaking at this uh, uh, before this uh, strike, and he was arrested by the by the police, and he was condemned to I think five years in in uh, in uh, in a prison, and after his uh, release. He, uh, the police gave him a lot of money and say and 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 said that he should leave the country to uh, the United States. They gave him a, a ticket to the United States, and there, in the first instance, he tried to establish uh, some kind of of uh, utopian socialist the commune in in the U.S., but it uh, went wrong, and then he went into real estate. But what is interesting is that he actually succeeded in in this uh, real estate, and he uh, sold. Uh, he had a, a urban project where he wanted to create near Chicago uh, a small city called White City, where he sold um, he sold houses to Scandinavian immigrants. Mm. But one of the things with the when when he advertised uh, the selling of these uh, houses was that it was a white city it has they could only live people uh, white people in this uh, community wow. that uh, that this uh, leader of the socialist movement and and this was actually the the attitude of these uh, settlers uh, they they uh, they were included in the racism uh, ac actually uh, existed in in the United States and when they went there of course they were included in in this uh, in this uh, culture. Yeah. And that kind of speaks to another issue I was hoping you would elaborate on. And it's the that, you know, in your book, I learned that both Denmark and Sweden were both involved in the slave trade. 
uh, though they don't really get the kind of recognition for that that some other some of the European countries do. Uh, and it seems that both did try and fail to become colonial powers, if I'm not mistaken. So mm. why is that? And what were their roles specifically in colonialism beyond the sort of settlerism you just talked about? Also, uh, Denmark was uh, was a, a big uh, slave uh, transporter from uh, Ghana. Uh, I think I think we were number four or five. Uh, of course, uh, England and and the United States and some other countries were were bigger. But I think we transported around one hundred thousand slaves from mainly from Ghana to to uh, the uh, to. Uh, the uh, Caribbean islands, and we are, we, we have our own uh, 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 co colonies there to produce sh uh, sugar uh, cane uh, mainly. We sold actually, we sold the the Virgin Islands to the United States in uh, 1910 for 10 million dollars. Um, so it's not new that uh, we are selling uh, property to, to the, the United States. I don't know if you remember, but Trump wanted to buy Greenland uh, for a couple <laughs> yeah. of, of, uh, of uh, years. So we have been selling uh, property <laughs> with people to the United States uh, uh, be before. Um, uh, Sweden also, uh, they, did, they didn't have, I, I think they only have uh, 10 slave transport, but, but, but they, um, they, um, Actually, they uh, produced a lot of uh, of salted herrings for for feeding for for the slaves uh, transport, and also they made a lot of iron bars, uh, which was uh, used in in the slave building. So they were surely in uh, included in the in the transportation. You you know we have to see the European uh, colonialism as as one project, some big state. They could take care of the military uh, power and administrative uh, capacity to to establish the the uh, colonies. And other countries like the Scandinavian ha had to ride on the wave of these big countries and and supply other logistic things as um, as uh, transport and so on. But there was no difference between the attitude towards colonialism between Sweden and Denmark and Germany and um, and uh, and I I England. You, um, for instance, Sweden uh, participated very much in one of the most ugly uh, uh, forms of colonialism, the colonialism of Belgium in, in uh, Congo. And there, uh, the Swedish uh, army um, was involved in helping the 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 Belgians in their military expedition in uh, in uh, in uh, Congo. A lot of Swedish uh, officers were working as mercenaries in in the Belgian uh, army, and I know that in the museum in in the Stockholm, there are all kinds of ugly artifacts, uh, maybe in the cellar of the museum, uh, uh, parts of bodies and so on, and trophies from from Sweden, uh, from Swedish people uh, participating in in uh, colonialism in uh, Congo. So, yeah, the Scandinavian countries were were certainly uh, I I involved, and colonialism matters very much because. You can say that okay, this was my uh, ancestors, and this is no business of of mine. It's two hundred years or hundred mm -hmm. years uh, a, a, ago. But we have to remember that that this colonialism established the the foundation, the economic foundation on on which imperialism continues in the economic sense, and it also established the the culture, the culture of colonialism still lives within. Uh, Europeans in the form of uh, racism and Eurocentrism and, and and so on. So we cannot claim that that this period is is over. We still have a responsible and colonialism still matters uh, very much. And I so actually, I think... you know, yeah. Well, since you mentioned the issues of uh, before, actually, before we get to the kind of like the racism and national chauvinism that you're talking about, I just wanted to very briefly, because you mentioned the Congo, ask about this figure that you wrote about the Sweden UN is Swedish UN Secretary General 
whose name I'm about to butcher because I can't pronounce. <laughs> I, it's Dag Hammarskjöld. Okay, the, yeah, I, the, what you just said. <laughs> yeah, Dag Hammarskjöld, yeah. Yes. So he sided with Belgium and the Americans against the legendary Congolese revolutionary Patrice Lumumba. Can you just briefly explain the conflict between these two men? Because then Dag Hammarskjöld later died Hammer, in a Hammer mysterious. Shirt. Thank yeah. you, Hammarskjöld. Yeah. Later, he later died in a mysterious plane crash, and I'm also curious if you have a theory about the cause of that. Well, I'd say it, it's of course it's an independent uh, Swedish. He he was a social democrat, and and he I think he has a position in, in the in the Swedish government uh, before he became. Uh, UN secretary, um, mm. but anyway, um, uh, the case is that um, that there was this uh, Lumumba was uh, elected f for for president uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in Congo. I think it was in sixty or, or something like that. I I, I don't mm. uh, remember, but but part of. Uh, of, uh, but but the Belgium was not, and and he was a left wing, uh, uh, and he wanted to uh, to draw um, Congo out of the imperialist uh, orbit, mm -hmm. and this was uh, certainly not uh, accepted, especially by the the settlers in in uh, uh, Congo in the Katanga province, which was the rich uh, uh, province which had all the the minerals. Uh, so they were very much uh, against uh, uh, this, and they um, they made an uh, alliance with uh, a, a, a local uh, fraction in uh, in uh, Congo, and they uh, draw this this uh, Katanga uh, out of uh, out of uh, Congo. Uh, they wanted to make uh, their own uh, republic. Um, and this uh, created a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, Lumumba was um, trying to um, to draw uh, Congo out of the imperialist uh, orbit, and this was very much uh, against uh, the West interest, especially U.S. interest, and also Belgium uh, interest and the whole mining I industries uh, interest. So all of them actually, both the CIA and the Belgians. Um, and and local Congolese people they they plotted to uh, liquidate uh, Lumumba and they certainly uh, uh, did, did and uh, the United States under the leadership of the Doc Hammarskjöld did nothing to defend uh, Lumumba they elected the president uh, of the new state and they knew all about it uh, uh, the threats. Uh, against him and he was held and kept prisoners for some time without uh, they did anything to get him released or, or save uh, his uh, uh, life. Um, there were also actually Swedish mining interests uh, in, mm. uh, in uh, 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 Congo at the time. But I think it's, um, it's uh, kind of, it, it shows, it shows that this uh, this uh, feeling, this gut feeling of of many uh, social democrats and many Swedes that actually our interest is is best served by uh, the security of the United States and um, and this is the best way to protect our our uh, way of living. So I I, I think that the, the United uh, the United, uh, not the United States, but the, the United Nations was very biased in in this situation, and 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 uh, actually, Dag Hammarskjöld was 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 celebrated as a very um, as a very uh, big diplomat and a very big uh, figure in in the West. But I think his his handling of 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 the situation in in the Congo is is not very. Um, it's not uh, very good, and it, it's correct. He he was uh, murdered actually, or, or his plane was shot down, or or disappeared under under 
very suspicious um, circumstances. Actually, his his body was never found, uh, 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 and uh, it is never solved who shot it down. There there are some South African mercenaries and agents which which claim that that they shot the plane down and and they got money from the Belgian mining companies to. Uh, to uh, do it, but the case is never solved. There was this other Swede, and I guess very briefly before we kind of yeah. move on to the other stuff, there was another Swede who has suffered a very mysterious death, and that was Olaf Palm, who yeah. in 1986, this he was a Swedish prime minister known for his commitment to the non-aligned policy and his support for national liberation movements, and even Cuba, and he was assassinated. Um, and he was also a harsh critic of the U.S., and of course, there's a lot of theories for how this happened. Is it known who did it and why? No, no, it, it, it's known. it's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, never solved. It it could be uh, petty cr uh, criminal uh, by some kind of uh, coincidence, or, or of course, it could also be a, 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 a political uh, a plot. And it's correct that that. Uh, Palme was was very uh, was very uh, against uh, Americans' war in uh, Vietnam and and actually sided with the uh, North Vietnam in in uh, in that uh, war. But he he was not uh, very he was not anti United States uh, at all. Uh, he. Uh, if, if we go through his history, he got his education in in the United States, and uh, he was uh, rec recruited while he was at university in the United States by the CIA, and he reported back. Uh, he participated in a in a lot of uh, socialist uh, social democratic student meetings in, on uh, in the world. And he handed over information about the the participants uh, uh, to the to the uh, CIA, and mm -hmm. and while while he was uh, very critical against the U.S. in uh, Vietnam, at the same time, uh, he uh, undercover was working with the the United States um, and uh, NATO. In monitoring the Baltic Sea and and which is bordering to the Soviet to the Soviet Union at the time, and there was a military cooperation between Sweden and the and the NATO uh, against the the, the Soviet uh, uh, Union. The the U.S. assisted uh, Sweden in their missile system and their submarine uh, equ equipment and and and, uh, and and so on. I think he. He uh, his view uh, on Vietnam was that it was stupid uh, that the, the U.S. Uh, had this uh, war and it was cruel, but it was a it was a mistake. He was not mm. uh, against U.S. imperialism as uh, as such and and against the U.S. policy uh, as such. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. who, who that goes uh, killed along. him? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You were going to say who killed him. We're not no, sure. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I really don't. I, I have no opinion of of, of uh, who uh, 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 killed him. Uh, yeah, that's what's just I wanted to. Well, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, it goes along with the U.S. pattern at the time of really trying to fund and cultivate an anti-communist kind of left. Um yeah. So that that you know, go along with that, but you know, going back to what we were referring to earlier, you had started talking about racism and just you know you you trace racism and national chauvinism in modern day right wing movements to the colonial era. So I'm curious if you could maybe explain that connection. Um, because I I wanted to say something about uh, the formation of the special kind of of welfare state in uh, Sweden mm. and uh, in. Uh, uh, Denmark, because going back to 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 settlerism, actually it it solved a lot of problems uh, in uh, Sweden because you got rid of the so-called reserve army, uh, the the excess of uh, labor. When you get uh, twenty five percent of the population, they uh, go to uh, U.S. The remaining part of the labor force. Gets a lot of better uh, con conditions for 
for organizing and for getting uh, higher wages. And we especially, and, and around uh, 1870, we, we, we have the breakthrough of, of socialism, both in uh, Denmark and, and in, in uh, Sweden. And it's very interesting in but both the programs are, are based on, on the German Socialist uh, Party's uh, program, the so-called Gotha uh, uh, program, which is very different from, from the Socialist uh, uh, First International, um, headed by uh, Marx, uh, because it's, it's much more nationalistic. Uh, the German Gotha uh, program uh, for, for socialism is very different from from the socialism uh, which was uh, uh, moved forward by uh, Marx and the First International, um, it was much more nationalistic, and uh, it was also uh, it stated that uh, Marx was wrong. It stated that it was possible to move towards socialism uh, within the capitalist uh, system, and it was possible slowly by and uh, by and by parliament to reach uh, a socialism and this was also the the idea of uh, Sweden that it's possible to develop socialism uh, within um, the capitalist uh, system and slowly they got higher wages they got uh, they got uh, included in in the parliamentarian uh, system they got more civil rights um, and and so on and slowly they were transformed from proletarians to citizens in the state and um, and the, the living standard was uh, raised very quickly uh, uh, um, between actually bet also between the the two uh, world wars uh, and the uh, the Social Democrats remained in, in, in power in Sweden for half a century, and especially after the, after the Second World War, uh, the living standard was raising very high they, uh, with consumer goods, uh, re refrigerators, uh, TV, cars, uh, uh, tourism to Mallorca and Spain. The inspiration from Germany was not only, you know, in, in this political term, it was actually also in in uh, German politics uh, at the time. Uh, the the head of the German government was this uh, Kanzler Bismarck, and actually he introduced a lot of social reforms in uh, in uh, Germany uh, and a lot of security for uh, German uh, workers in 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 terms of benefits if if they get. Um, if they uh, got hurt at work or, or lost their their uh, jobs and and uh, so on, and the reason why Bismarck did this was was partly because he wanted to ally with the Social Democrats uh, against the the Liberal uh, Party in uh, Germany because the Liberal wants to get rid of the of the Emperor, and Bismarck wanted to. Uh, uh, remain uh, with the emperor, and also because he wanted to create a, a divide between communist, radical, communist, socialist in uh, in uh, a, a Germany, and this was also very much the case in in uh, in Sweden. There was this radical divide by the social democrat majority, and they kind of squeezed out a small uh, communist uh, uh, fraction uh, of the. Swedish uh, uh, working class. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, well, so, so moving to the issue of what I was asking about earlier, because th that kind of goes to where I was asking about racism and national chauvinism. You know, we usually associate these Scandinavian countries with these kinds of two contradictory phenomena, right? On the one hand, they've welcomed. I would say a disproportionate amount of refugees and migrants from places that the U.S. has been responsible for destroying, like Iraq and Somalia and Syria. But they've also, as a result of some of this, seen a sharp and possibly related rise of right-wing anti-immigrant movements. So 
why is it that on the one hand you have this kind of seemingly seeming generosity from Scandinavian countries, but then also this backlash? And would you relate that to this idea of right wing movements being connected to the colonial era? Um, and, you know, that connection. And then how does that connect to, I guess, the welfare state ends up getting destroyed as a result? Yeah, so a lot of support actually in in. in Sweden for Nazi, uh, because Sweden was uh, neutral uh, during the, the Second World War, but it allowed the, uh, it allowed uh, Nazi uh, Germany to move troops and material through Sweden, offensive against the Soviet Union, uh, and it uh, allowed also uh, German uh, bases uh, uh, in, in this uh, process. And also Sweden was a very, very important uh, uh, exporter of uh, iron and bearing balls and machines to, to Nazi Germany through the Second World War. Actually, they, they exported material to, to Nazi Germany up until January 45, that is two, three months before the breakdown of of Nazi uh, 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 Germany, so so they maintained this uh, export. Uh, it was partly pa paid because it was partly paid in hard cash in gold. Actually, um, most of the gold have been um, have been taken from from Jews in uh, Europe. So it's an it's a very embarrassing uh, story for uh, Sweden. But actually. Um, Sweden maintained this uh, right-wing position also after the the war. Sweden was uh, in the fifties. Uh, 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 that means just after the war, a kind of center of of re reorganizing the the far right uh, and Nazi uh, uh, movement uh, globally, uh, and they also. Has helped in uh, in um, the escape of many Nazis to uh, South America. There's there's also links to if you know this big uh, Swedish company uh, IKEA, oh, which yes, makes furniture <laughs> uh, uh, globally. Yeah, yeah. The the founder of uh, IKEA uh, have very close links to to uh, the, the far right in, in uh, Sweden, uh, also since the, the uh, Second World War. But um, uh, actually, uh, Sweden was also, uh, if in many cases, Sweden have been very open to, to uh, immigrants when there uh, was this uh, coup in uh, Chile against Salvador Allende. Sweden took a lot of the refugees from uh, Chile and they were treated very, very uh, well. The problems with with uh, refugees um, uh, coming in the last uh, decades have created a right-wing movement. But this is very much, it, it has to do with this, uh, it's uh, that, that uh, Many people in in uh, Sweden and Denmark they they feel that these uh, refugees and uh, immigrants are are um, are competing with them in, on on social welfare. Now, if if this immigrant all this uh, uh, refugees uh, shall have uh, uh, social benefits and uh, social welfare, oh then there is not enough social welfare and social benefits for uh, me. So. So they think that the, this uh, Im immigrants are, are, are eroding their welfare states. Huh? They don't want to share. Actually, it's like a spoiled child who who don't want to uh, <laughs> share. It's very much that attitude, uh, uh, which 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 is the which is the background for uh, this kind of uh, racism. I see. And then you were talking earlier about the uh, about the Gotha system. What is the idea of the people's home? I know that's that's something you wanted to discuss. Yeah, it, it, it's it's um, it's well, the idea is to create um, um, a state 
for everybody and 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 it's not based on a, on a class but it's based on on the notion of 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 people instead of uh, of uh, a class because if you talk in 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 uh, class terms uh, you create enemies but when we talk about the people it include everybody so they they like this uh, and it's also like uh, it's also from very much from a ins inspiration from a, a, a Germany. Everything in Germany is also the people, the the folk, the, the Volkswagen and the folk mm -hmm. and the folk. So it's it's also an inspiration from uh, from uh, 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 Germany. Um, so so it's the same thing. Uh, I I I I, th I think yeah. You know, I'm always I've always wondered, you know, why it is that social social democracy never developed in the US in the same way it did in much of Europe. And you make this interesting point about how the introduction of social reforms for populations in northern Europe were actually designed to strengthen imperialism abroad. Can you briefly explain what that means? If you give higher wages and you include the the population in the system, you kind of of uh, securing a, a secure home base for your imperialist uh, act activities. But it's but it's also a way how imperialism uh, uh, functions at the moment by exploiting this low wage uh, labor. But you have to also to uh, realize uh, the profit by selling the commodities. And uh, if you have a uh, high high wage in your home base, then you can sell the the commodities in in a in a, in a consumer market, which have a, a high consumer uh, market. So the low wage countries uh, secure uh, uh, the surplus value, and the profit is realized by selling it uh, on the home market in the in the uh, global uh, north. So you have this. Um, uh, division of of uh, of um, of um, not of labor, but but uh, how to get the profit and how to realize the, the the profit, and this is the this is the way that the Swedish imperialism uh, uh, works uh, at at the moment. If if for instance you take um, Swedish uh, 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 companies, the the I, I, the biggest Swedish transnationalist uh, 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 companies, you will say that they employ more than half a million people in uh, in low wage uh, uh, countries. It's, for instance, Volvo and it's LM Ericsson and and uh, and so on. Alone in in China and India, there are more people working in the industrial sector. In the industrial sector, uh, there are more people working uh, in China and India uh, for Swedish firms than in Sweden itself. Wow! <laughs> if you, for instance, take uh, if if we take a, a concrete example, uh, Volvo, the personal uh, cars of, of of Volvo is sold for a long time ago to uh, China. Uh, all uh, Volvo personal cars are are um, produced in in uh, China or in other countries, but they are owned by a, a, a Chinese company. But Volvo still produce a lot of trucks and a lot of buses. And the main office in in for Volvo is is based in uh, Gothenburg in uh, in uh, Sweden. But actually, uh, most of the production takes place in uh, in China, Brazil, Russia, Poland, Indonesia, Indian. Thailand, South Africa, Mexico, and 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 uh, in uh, in uh, South uh, Co Korea. And if we take a, a specific uh, example, if we take the Volvo plant in in Durban, in uh, in uh, South Africa, the salary on this Volvo factory is around uh, two dollars per hour, and it makes uh, three hundred and ninety dollars per month. The same work which is produced there is also produced in in uh, in uh, Gothenburg, but uh, here the wage is it's ten times higher, 
it's uh, three thousand nine hundred uh, dollars, and it's the same. It's the same equipment. It's the same uh, productivity. There's no uh, difference. It's just the wage, which is uh, very uh, different. And the only have this uh, this uh, pr production is is Scottenberg for the, for the near European market and mm. and and for Sweden itself. Most of the the production is outsourced to to other companies but but if on top of this you take the all the production for swedish companies which is made uh, by local companies you know for ikea and for the close uh, industry um it's it's uh, nearly 1 million people who are working in the low wage countries for for Swedish uh, companies and generating a, a profit for Sweden, so it's it's that's the way that I call Sweden and Denmark a, a parasite states, which have an uh, imperial mode of uh, living, and this imperial mode of living they can only uphold because other people are not having the same uh, living standard. But that's imperialism imperial, benefit, be, yeah, and. Imperialism benefits from this huge consumer capacity in the in the global north because they they can uh, they can get the surplus value they can they can get the foundation from the from the profit by exploring uh, low wage uh, work in in the third world and then they can realize and get the money by by selling it in in the in the global north. What a system. Um, you know, Torkel, I belong to a generation that was largely, I think, radicalized by the U.S. invasion of Iraq and the WMD lies. Uh, but you grew up during uh, the original Cold War, not the new one, but the first yeah. one. Um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis and the U.S. war on Vietnam and eventually during the 1968 uprising. So you know, which I hope you can elaborate on. And and you were introduced to the communist working circle. You actually have this incredibly fascinating personal trajectory. So, you know, I'm curious if you could just explain briefly to our audience how you got politicized and radicalized sure. um, into sure. leftist anti-imperialism. Sure. And this was precise, this, uh, this situation in the parasite state with, with its imperial mode of living in the late uh, in the late 60s uh, actually and on one side we made this uh, uh, analyze of the world that uh, in our part of the world uh, there was no real interest in in uh, socialism of course people wanted uh, higher wages and they wanted a uh, longer holiday and they wanted uh, a a better life, and this is um, this is very legitimate. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with wanting socialism. And people certainly didn't want socialism. They wanted uh, uh, they wanted um, the capitalist welfare state and more uh, welfare. On one hand, we experience that situation. On the other hand, when we look around. Uh, the world in 1969, we saw that there was uh, 40, 50 revolutionary uh, um, uh, uprisings, uh, not only in uh, Vietnam, but also in Thailand, the Philippines, uh, Iran against the, the Shah, um, in the Middle East, the Palestinians, uh, even in the Arabic uh, Gulf in South Yemen and in uh, Dufa mm -hmm. and Oman, uh, e even in this very reactionary part of the Arab world, there was uprising at the time. There was, of course, in in uh, Africa from Algeria to South Africa and Namibia, Angola, Mozambique, uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Zimbabwe. If we go to Latin America, we can go from from uh, Mexico to Chile. Uh, there was a lot of, if you put pinpoints um, in a world map at that time, 
the prospects for a world revolution was uh, very good. There was a very revolutionary spirit also in terms of, of the Chinese cultural revolution. So on one hand, we have this situation uh, in Denmark and in Scandinavia, uh, which was not very interested in what was not very interested in revolution, and we have this huge revolutionary uh, wave in the in the rest of the world. So our idea and strategy was that uh, we should support these uprisings so they would uh, succeed, um, and then they could cut the straws uh, of imperialism. Uh, and then by that way, creating a, a revolutionary um, situation in our own country uh, in uh, maybe in, in 10 or, or 15 so years, so we can start uh, uh, working uh, on that. In, in, in practical uh, terms, what do, does this uh, imply for a praxis uh, and to support the liberation movements? Uh, we thought that we should support the liberation movement uh, met in material terms. Solidarity is something you can hold in your hands. It's not just uh, writing a statement or uh, having a, a demonstration. It is actually a material support, which uh, is very open. It's very Im important. And we, um, we, had, we developed both uh, legal support uh, collecting uh, clothes and making fleet markets and uh, uh, buying medicine and uh, all kinds of things and uh, uh, transferred by to the liberation movement in in uh, on legal terms. But we also wanted to expand uh, this uh, sub support by using on legal means because we saw a, an op op opportunity to really uh, get access to to um, uh, f financial means and all the kinds of uh, material which we uh, could uh, support uh, uh, the struggle with. And then we, um, the idea was not to go on the ground and to, and to start this struggle because we knew that we would be hunted down very fast. Uh, this was what happening in in uh, Germany and in Italy uh, or other places that the intelligence service and police and paramilitary forces would very, very quickly uh, uh, hunt down this kind of of, uh, of underground movements because they were not fish in the water. Uh, we don't have mar uh, mountains and, and, uh, and forests. Actually, they worked in a hostile environment with not with no substantial support from 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 uh, the masses. So instead of underground, we went undercover, and that means that um, uh, we made our, our financial operations, which was basically uh, robberies and uh, fraud, fin financial fraud with false documents. We never, we didn't issue any revolutionary pro proclamations. Why we we did it? On the contrary, it it seems like ordinary crime, maybe very professional and organized crime, but ordinary crime. And uh, so this was uh, on one hand uh, going undercover was to um, to survive for a long time. And actually we survived for nearly uh, 20 years, but it was also a way of um, acquiring skills for future organizations we learned how to falsify documents, we learned how to pick a lock, we learned how to steal a car, we learned how to set up a safe place, we learned how to make secret communication and avoid surveillance and all this kind of, of skills which which is needed for, for an organization. So, we, so it was, uh, and this was also why we were undercover, that we wanted to, to, um, to stay for the long how we wanted to stay in business for the long time huh? we had a long plan and uh, actually we uh, we, uh, we we succeeded with this work uh, from uh, around 1970 1979 and and up to 
1889, uh, April 89, where, where our cover uh, was uh, broken. And it was broken due to many, many, many small mistakes in, in these uh, 20 years and also because of a tragic uh, car accident, which uh, uh, gave the police a lot of documents which, which, um, which um, they needed to, uh, to make the first uh, arrests uh, 20 years later. So I think this was a very, um, this was a very, um, when I look back on, on it, I, I, I don't, I, I look back on it on, on uh, not in regret, uh, but it was, uh, I, I like this, uh, that we have a very clear analysis of how the world works. From this, we could make a, a strategy. And from this strategy, we could make a, a praxis what to do tomorrow to uh, have an impact on the world situation. So we have this analysis, strategy, and praxis which fitted uh, uh, together. And this is very important for any uh, political organization that they have this uh, clear alliance. They have a clear strategy built on, on the analysis and they have a clear idea of what is the indication for the strategy uh, in terms of, of what to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's incredible. And honestly, it's surprising it hasn't been made into a movie. Um, but on, you know, on it's really your, your personal story is really actually, amazing. And I, it, I, yeah, go ahead. It has been actually. It, it has oh. been. A, uh, it has been. It's not very good. It's it's a <laughs> it's a fictional. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a series. I don't want to know if it's on uh, on uh, on Netflix or something. But it has it has been made into a series. Yeah. We'll have to find this. You. Uh, we'll have to find the series. What's the name? Do you know the name? Uh, I think it's the the. Blinking gang, I'm maybe blinking gang after which is one the of name, our which is the name cases. of your, which is the name, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's actually yeah. really interesting, and I guess I encourage people to go check that out. But your your personal story really is incredible, and I think very rare to have anything that exists like that today. But just kind of you know uh, moving on to related topics the, here. I, I I want to we we made it there, there's a book made about it calling. Uh, it's called uh, turning turning money into revolution. Actually, there you go. well, there you go. Read the book. book. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> Read the book. We. <laughs> um, so, but 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 moving on to issues related to this, um, and that's the issue I want to talk about here. That you know of neoliberalism, um, and how it's shaped the world in no. the past fifty years. You know, capitalism and imperialism have gone through these different phases. Over the past 200 years, many of which you talked about, we have colonialism under British Empire. We have the sort of classic imperialism, the sort of neocolonialism under U.S. hegemony. You know, given your long experience, uh, I'm wondering if you could discuss how you see global neoliberalism having shaped the world in the past 50 years. Yes, uh, I think uh, it there has always been this um, this contradiction in in uh, global capitalism between its its need to expand its need to become more more globalized both in terms of of quantity or and in quality on the other hand there have been this uh, mainly political force of nationalism which want to control the development of, of capitalism within uh, national uh, uh, borders and if we if we go back to to this uh, to this uh, revolutionary upheaval in the late uh, 60s it actually was a great threat to capitalism at the time you have this attack from the from the third world on the other hand, you still have also the the socialist uh, bloc. Um, uh, the Soviet Union has moved to to uh, a more uh, wanted to have uh, cooperation and peaceful coexistence with capitalism. But uh, you also have China, which uh, which was more ag ag aggressive 
at the time and, and supporting uh, world, world re re revolution. And on top of this, you have the pressure from the social democrats, which wanted more higher wage and more uh, social benefits and so on. So capitalism was was uh, under pressure. But then, then, uh, then uh, capitalism wait, uh, went on counter attack with uh, with uh, neoliberalism. Um, first, it uh, it happened in in uh, Western Europe and in U.S. Margaret Thatcher in, in England and Reagan in America. They they uh, ma they went against the trade movement and they went against the social state and the and they uh, have uh, privatization and they deregulation of trade and uh, financial transfer and and uh, and so on but it was just it was just the start the real the the, the real uh, neoliberalism neoliberalism was outsourcing uh, high wage labor to low wage uh, country and this was an enormous uh, enormous uh, move i think that that hundreds of millions of new uh, industrial uh, proletarians uh, was established and uh, in in, in uh, the global south and the number of industrial workers in North America and in Europe de declined. It was a huge uh, new division of uh, of uh, uh, labor and it gave neoliberalism 50 years of very high uh, 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 profit. But this old uh, contradiction between between uh, this uh, uh, globalization, tendency of uh, globalization, and different kinds of uh, nationalism. It, it uh, developed slowly, slowly. The erosion of the welfare state in the global north, the decline of, of uh, wages, the influx of immigrants to which was seen as eroding the welfare state and, and, and so on. It, it created you know, the nationalism. Uh, in the uh, uh, global north. On the other hand, and here I am, it's most important to look at at uh, China neoliberalism. It actually developed the pr the productive forces of uh, 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 China. China's encounter with neoliberalism was very very different from from the neoliberalism in Brazil or or in uh, Mexico, or in Indonesia, or in Bangladesh, and or in India, or, and, and so on, because the the Chinese Communist Party um, maintained in power, and they maintained as uh, uh, some kind of of state plan. They maintained control over the financial system. They maintained control over over the ownership of uh, land. And, on all, and they maintained also con control with vital infrastructure, uh, state-owned infrastructure, and also uh, strategic uh, in industry. So where many countries uh, was uh, very much exploited by, by the encounter with neoliberalism, yes, China was also uh, e exploited the Chinese working class, especially in in the 90s uh, uh, was working very hard for a re very low um, uh, wage generating huge profit for for capitalism but china developed its productive forces and it also uh, was able to seize control over new technology and and so on so china kind of broke this evil evil spell which have been on the third world this polarizing um tendency where where the poor country becomes poorer and the rich becomes richer this was for the first time broken by by uh, china china not only chi chinese capitalists but also chinese workers and chinese peasants have becoming uh, more and more higher wages during the the last uh, decades in the last decades i think the the wage in china for a normal worker have tripled they have pulled uh, millions millions out of poverty in the in the in the countryside so china has have have a very different kind of of um, experience 
the neoliberalism and have kind of used it uh, as a horse to pull it out uh, of backwardsness. And um, so this was an uh, another development which has changed the the, the contradictions between um, between um, the tendency for globalization and, and uh, nationalism um, in uh, in uh, global neoliberalism. I think we now have this very very strange um, a mixture that 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 the productive hardware um, the global production change um, is still in the hands. You know, cars are still cars and electronic and clothes and so on are still produ produced in in this globalized manner in long uh, production change going from the global north to the global south. Uh, most the most important um, firms in 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 the world uh, in electronic Apple, but also Google, Amazon, uh, and all these um, other countries. They they uh, they are very much keen to proceed with globalization and proceed with neoliberalism and have an open world. Uh, so the hardware is still processed and um, and owned by people who want to have a neoliberal globalization. But on the political side, um, nationalism is is uh, rising everywhere, bo both as radical uh, right wing, but also populist uh, left wing, and also like uh, Chinese nationalism with the socialism with Chinese characteristics. So then we have many kinds of of uh, nationalism uh, on 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 the rise. So this uh, difference between uh, between the hardware is still uh, uh, globalized and 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 politics um, becoming more and more uh, nationalist is is a huge problem because the whole the whole uh, way of govern uh, global cap capitalism is eroding. We don't have this uh, 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 G meetings where, in the good phase, and uh, and where 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 we are all into the same. The, the G meetings are now uh, only the West, the WTO, not that influence anymore. Americans are eroding uh, neoliberalism because of the trade war. With China and now the with the Russia and they also have sanctions with Cuba and I Iran and Venezuela and 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 so on. All this old time uh, economic uh, liberalism is uh, disappearing, and and now we are turning to old school uh, territorial uh, <laughs> like uh, before the First World War. So so uh, the game is changing radically in these years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's quite, it's quite, yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting just to, to watch this play out. I think what you said about China is so interesting, too, because um, that I think is what makes China such a threat is that it's managed to be this global South country that's taken neoliberalism, used it to develop itself and kind of offered, kind of offered a model for other countries in the global South, an alternative model. Um, to some degree for other countries in the global south to maybe follow. But I want to get to that. But I also wanted to talk, and I think you wanted to talk about the future um, and what this all means for the future. Um, and to, particularly after COVID-19. Um, and how has that played into this sort of crisis of neoliberalism that you're describing? Well, I, I think that this COVID-19 uh, pandemic it it of course um it uh, it uh, was the main topic on the agenda for this two years or, or something like that uh, but now it's mm -hmm. it's it, it's uh, it 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 functioned uh, like a like a steam bowler you know all the old contradictions and new contradictions they were they were kept in this steam boiler and and uh, now when the pandemic is is uh, is um, is uh, on the on the return 
we no no uh, on the decline we see that the steam is uh, letting up and a lot of old contradictions are are um, are growing at uh, high speed and and i see especially uh, a spiral between two kinds of of uh, of uh, contradictions at the moment uh, for the first uh, uh, the first is this uh, decline of neoliberalism and the return to to more territorial uh, rivalry in, in the world that it's not so much anymore in economic uh, competition it's on military uh, com competition also because uh, if you look at, at at the statistic you will see that that the china has becoming the factory of the world it's producing much more uh, industrial products than than the United States. Its trade is much bigger than the United uh, States. The United States cannot compete with China in 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 uh, in many uh, aspects. Uh, China is not only producing uh, cheap shoes and and clothes, it's using high tech uh, uh, co components. So. Um, the U.S. have to compete with China not on economical terms as they could with the Soviet Union uh, in the old Cold War. It was no problem because they were superior in in economics. They are not anymore, so they had to compete in in the military. So we will see this this military competition becoming much more uh, important. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the the pandemic. Uh, to to uh, get uh, to save uh, capitalism under the pandemic many states they issued bonds and bills uh, without any foundation in production they just they just produced paper uh, money on an enormous scale mm -hmm. so the debts in the in the world have doubled or or tripled and have an a huge um, it's a huge uh, bubble of financial papers and bonds which 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 can uh, which can blow up in a in a huge uh, uh, a crisis and the crisis is now growing because of of the war with uh, uh, Russia and as the prices are rising especially here in Europe and North America and everywhere in the third world of all kinds of of uh, of products the economic crisis are going uh, worse and it fuels um, it fuels uh, more nationalism and it fuels more war so we had this spiral between rising economic crisis and nationalism and new wars which which feed each other so uh, i think we are in for a very dramatic uh, uh, period uh, because uh, us is using more military um, a means to stay uh, in hit to stay on top and to maintain its he hegemony and 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 a huge economic crisis is under the development so um, so we are into uh, a, a very interesting decades uh, I, I, I i i think yeah 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 no and, it's frightening it's frightening yeah yeah and and i think the so yeah it's frightening but it's also it's also um it's also you can see you you, you can say that that the uh, that your objective forces for ch the objective conditions for change and for mm -hmm. ending uh, capitalism are very very good i don't think the system will s survive this um this uh, century, because on top of this, we also had the climate crisis, and all this rivalry makes it more and more difficult to do anything to postpone or to uh, try to um, try to help the help the uh, the uh, climate uh, crisis. So this crisis, on top of it, it's it's also growing. So it's a triple. It's a trip. It's it's war. It's uh, climate. It's economic, which is melting. Which, which is melting down to one, to one part, uh, which make it uh, various. And and I said, as I said, the objective con conditions are are good. The the problem is the subjective con conditions. The organization of the forces which should uh, thrive to um, 
to turn uh, to turn the a struggle into a, a revolutionary struggle for 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 socialism yeah and that yeah. they are yeah yeah if you, for example take your own country uh, lebanon yeah we have seen a mm-hmm. lot of uh, a lot of uprisings and uh, but but they seem they seem spontaneous they don't have this they don't have this strategy how to move on to the next step how to organize different kinds of struggle and different kinds of of, uh, of sectors and what should the practice be they they try to appeal to the government or they want another government and another president but they they don't know they, they don't know they don't have a specific plan or what they don't have an ideology or... they don't have an ideology no, no, no. <laughs> you know it's not just yeah it's not just the, that's a really good point we do see these kinds of up like spontaneous sort of uprisings that are quickly sometimes quickly hijacked by the sort of like ngo liberal class mm. who mm. don't really have any real ideology except more liberalism with like mm. you know demand making demands of the government without having any sort of plan or, or ability to organize people. That's a really good point. And I'm just curious, you know, moving forward, like what is the, where does that leave us in terms of, I think it's a really good point you make. You're basically saying that, yeah, there's all these scary things happening. There's all these contradictions taking place and it's going to get worse because of all these issues that you mentioned, but it also presents an opportunity for an organized left, mm. um, some sort of revolutionary left. So what measures do you think, I guess, our struggle as leftists, as anti-imperialists should take to combat this sort of globalized capitalism in a moment where there is an opportunity to push back against it? That's a really hard question. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but but first of all, I, I, I think I, 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 I will underline what, what, what you said, that we should not be scared for the crisis. We should not be... Uh, afraid of the crisis uh, because crisis is an opportunity for a, a change. You know, the first socialist revolution came out of the first world war, eh? and the Chinese uh, revolution came out of of the second uh, uh, world war. So, so changes happens very quickly uh, in uh, in uh, this um, in this kind of of uh, situation. But but I think that that. Uh, I think that, as you mentioned, um, ideology is very uh, important, and this is um, what is important with creating a, a viable ideology and a, and a good ideology is a very, it, it's a very clear analysis of the world and 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 how it is moving, and this is very difficult at at the moment because things. Things are moving so fast, and there are strange alliances and 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 uh, strange things uh, going on. So you have to have a very clear and long perspective. Eh? I, I I think that people often have a very short perspective of one year or something. I think you have to plan for a five six years uh, per perspective, and you have to to organize. Of course, as 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 you mentioned, it's not enough to have uh, twitter and uh, facebook you have to you have to organ- yeah I, I think it's also the lesson of of the arab uh, uprising in in 2011 mm-hmm. it's not enough to assemble on squares and and uh, places and make demonstrations and call together in in uh, in uh, this kinds of of demonstrations and, and so on you have to to organize and you have to organize uh, both in in uh, a party which have a strategy, but also how to deal with different kinds of, of sectors, workers, peasants, students, uh, women's military struggle, uh, political struggle. Uh, you have to coordinate all this kind of, of, of struggles. Uh, um, and you have to take into account uh, when you make your plans and, and your strategy, the global perspective and what is what is the principal uh, contradiction uh, um, at the time because it has a huge impact on on uh, on what your alliances and what your strategy uh, should be and and it's uh, there's so much uprising 
going on, which 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 just seem disparate, like in Palestine for the for the right. moment, you also have this kind of disparate, spontaneous uh, up, uprising. But do, do, does the Palestinian have as a strategy anymore? Huh? It's very difficult to to uh, to uh, to see it. It's it's not the rockets from Gaza and attacks on where does it lead? Uh, uh, or, or, so I think this organization and making a viable strategy is. Uh, is is, uh, is central it's vital yeah 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 i just have a I, I really appreciate your time and i just have a couple more questions i wanted to ask you here yeah. while i have you and one of them is just to bring it back to the issue that we started with which was the issue of the scandinavian countries i think many of us particularly in the u.s where we like really desperately want higher wages and a better welfare state because we don't have one um we're unaware of the military industrial complex in the Scandinavian countries. And I'm just curious if you could briefly uh, discuss this military industrial complex that, Scan that the Scandinavian countries mm -hmm. are involved mm -hmm. in, because we just mm -hmm. don't know about it. No, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting, especially at, at, at the moment, because all the Scandinavian countries are investing heavily in uh, military equipment now. It's, 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 Sometimes I, I, I seems uh, it's like, uh, you know, just before the First World War, where all this, the socialists, they, they uh, in the socialists, the Second International, they promised to vote against the rising military uh, expansion and, and they would not uh, invest in the war. Now we see that both uh, uh, Denmark and Sweden and uh, Norway, they are they are investing millions in a military uh, built up, uh, and it's on many many scales. Um, for instance, uh, Denmark uh, three days ago, they sent uh, a, a battalion of uh, a thousand soldiers with with tanks and armored cars. To the to the Baltic state uh, to to be stationed uh, very near the the Soviet uh, border, and we have also a, a battalion in uh, Poland. Um, so uh, and and uh, we have we have just uh, negotiations with uh, um, um, uh, the U.S. state of establishing a. A U.S. base on 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 Danish soil in the near future. We already have a, a, a huge American base uh, in uh, Greenland in uh, Thule in the north of uh, Greenland. It has been there since the end of the of the Second World War, and we have made a new uh, or Greenland and and Denmark and um, and U.S. have made a, a, a new treaty about um, expanding the military um, cooperation in uh, in uh, in uh, Greenland because Greenland is is situated between you know America and uh, and Russia, so it's a ideal place to to launch uh, missiles, but also to detect uh, uh, missiles. So it's a very, very Im Im important. Uh, space and also now with the warmer climate you can navigate in the in the whole year uh, south and north of of, uh, of of greenland so so greenland is becoming very very important so we will see more american um, warships in uh, in uh, greenland and we will also establish uh, they have want to establish a uh, uh, round the clock uh, surveillance of uh, Greenland with the uh, drones. Uh, <laughs> wow! Uh, so, so there's a, a lot of uh, um, Sweden have always have a, a big um, a military industrial complex because it was out of NATO, so it has to have its own uh, military industry and a huge army they they have built their own submarines and they even also built their own uh, uh, jet fighters uh, airplanes um, which is very few countries i think it's only france and uh, and uh, us and maybe china and and russia which built their own jet fighters but, but sweden also built their 
their own uh, 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 jet fighters. And to kind of make this uh, military industry uh, viable and, and profitable, they, they also want, of course, to, to export the uh, military uh, Equipment and they have sold a lot of military e e equipment to uh, to the Gulf state uh, recently to uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, Qatar and 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 so on. And for they have uh, India has also been a very huge uh, customer of uh, of the Swedish uh, military uh, equ equ equipment. <laughs> so there's a lot of things uh, happening um, uh, in in uh, also on the military field in in the Scandinavian uh, uh, countries. And then you know just uh, briefly about Sweden, how seriously do you take these suggestions that Sweden might join NATO? I think they will, and I think also wow. that that, that uh, Finland will, and and it's it, it's it's actually. It, and I think it's it's uh, it's supported by the majority of the po population because there is this there's this gut feeling there's this gut feeling that okay the U.S. and Trump and uh, sometimes they are too much but uh, but uh, actually when it comes to the bottom line it is U.S. who protect our our way of life and it's U.S. who protect our freedom and it's U.S. who protect our imperial mode of, of living. There is this uh, there is this gut feeling that, that when it comes to the bottom we are part of the imperialist uh, system and because they are disregarding the history, they are disregarding what was the U.S. Uh, and is uh, doing. They are not talking about uh, the invasions of Iraq and uh, and uh, what is going on in, in many other places in in the third world. It's it's just that okay here the U.S. are protecting our liberty and our way of uh, life, and I think that we it's a kind of acceptance of uh, we are not halfway to socialism. We are actually part of of the U.S. imperialism. And, and this crisis is, is also, of, of course, uh, a, a way that, that U.S. have got Germany and France under the thump again. There was this movement sometimes that, that the European Union wanted to be more or less uh, independent of, of uh, American interest. But now they are really, they are really uh, under the thump of the U.S. Uh, again in terms of world policy yeah yeah it is kind of like when it comes to germany especially it's almost like a colony um of the u.s in terms of the way it behaves and its foreign policy but you have i mean it made it you know people who have that gut feeling in a way they're not wrong in the sense no, that no. i mean the u.s is protecting their way of life in some ways in the sense that imperialism exists and benefits the global north because of the u.s sitting at the top of it so, I mean, I guess it's a matter of like, of like being conditioned to be okay with the vast majority of the world living in like complete destitution mm. Um, mm. in order to have a more luxurious lifestyle. Um, mm. Although I'm sure people don't see it that way, but mm. that's the reality, is it not? Mm. Um, but but, but you on can't, that, oh, go ahead. You, you can't have it both ways you cannot say like like uh, Sanders then that, that it is halfway to socialism or socialism <laughs> right. or, or or some kind because this kind of of um, of capitalist welfare state can only e exist as a as a special part a special feature of of uh, imperialism Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But you know, I wanted to just one last question, and then I promise I will <laughs> relieve you. <laughs> um, but you know, I wanted to ask just now, as because I think that the left and a lot of the global north is struggling at the moment over how to view Russia's war in Ukraine and how to view Russia, right? Because Russia, after all, it's not it's not like China, you know. Um, nope. It has it's it's a very capitalist country. Um, it's not offering a different model or an ideology, an alternative ideology. So does the left have a stake in this conflict? And like, how do you see the, the right position to be on this issue? 
First of all, I I, I think that uh, that the development of of uh, of Russia um, is uh, you I, I I see it as as uh, as of course uh, as a special kind of of uh, of uh, capitalism. Um, you talk about this uh, oligarchy uh, uh, capitalism, which was uh, created by uh, by actually. Uh, the regime of uh, Yeltsin, which was uh, mm -hmm. installed by the Americans, maybe they have hoped for something different, but <laughs> this is what they this is what they uh, got. And um, I think that that uh, now I think that uh, in which way will Russia um, and 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 I certainly don't think that Russia is a is a progressive. You can see that 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 it's very hollow that that uh, that that Putin says that he is against the the Nazis in in Ukraine and and certainly there are Nazis in the Ukraine, but at the same time. He was supporter of the right wing in America. He was a supporter of uh, Trump and his friends, and he's supporter of of uh, also Le Pen, the right wing in in France, and right right wing movements in in many many countries. So it's it's a very strange that that he's against the Nazis in in Ukraine, but not but not in in the the, the West. But I think this situation will will change. The, you know, you talked about this socialism in in one country um, uh, cre created uh, in in the in the twenties in the Soviet Union. We might see now a, a, a kind of capitalism is in one country now that that Russia is becoming more isolated from the rest of the capitalist world. Um, before there was a huge outflux of of capital from uh, from the Soviet Union from uh, uh, this oligarchy, both uh, legal in investment, but also criminal money uh, went out of the country. Uh, the Danish banks participated in a huge whitewashing of of actually of uh, Russian uh, uh, money through through Danish banks in the Baltic state they they function as a washing machine for 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 capital from the Russian fleeting out it's a big scandal in Denmark it's billions of it's there was a huge little bank in in uh, one of the Baltic states and and through this little bank huge amounts of, of money went and the company just says oh we didn't know uh, and and it's so yeah and and I I I think some of this, of course, they can find other means to get their more money out. But but some of this outflux of uh, of capital from Russia will, it's becoming more difficult now. So more capital will be invested in in uh, Russia itself now, and it it can actually help the development of right. Of more it's ironic. <laughs> of, of a more healthy capitalism in in. In uh, and and a less uh, oligarchy and and less um, yeah and another kind so this could be uh, uh, one uh, uh, op op opportunity but but I I, I think that um, that um, the left what what is the left's uh, stake in this uh, conflict I, I I think that it's uh, it, it it is to see it to stop as soon as uh, as uh, possible uh, for the sake of the ukrainian uh, po population but i don't think it's uh, in the interest of the united states they want to prolong the struggle uh, as long as as possible because they want to inflict a defeat of the russian army and the russian army don't want a defeat so they will also uh, continue the the struggle so so this uh, this different interest i i i think uh, can keep this uh, this war for uh, a long time and also it, it's it's also what will the what will the if if uh, america succeed in inflicting a, a defeat on uh, russia on this kind of of uh, tactics uh, the next step 
would maybe try to make the same uh, the same kind of of conflict in uh, Taiwan with uh, with uh, with uh, a, a, a ch a ch China. So uh, um, uh, it's very much uh, it's very much in in the interest for for the for the left wing to to stop this kind of of. Uh, of inter-imperialist uh, rivalry with uh, with this uh, uh, going on because it just gets the appetite of of the United States to keep its hegemony with military uh, means um, uh, in place um, instead of moving towards this uh, more uh, multilateral uh, uh, world. Yeah. Well, well said. Torkel, I want to thank you for spending over an hour and a half with me. I really, really appreciate your time and all of your incredible work. And you, I really appreciate you breaking down all of these really important issues for us. And hopefully we can have you back on at some point in the future. Thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome.